Thank you. It's a great honor to be asked to deliver the commencement speech. Uh, I'm also, uh, thank you. I, I'm also very glad that uh, I wasn't required to put on a dress. I'm sure, I'm sure I would have tripped over it. Uh, I want to, in talking today, I want to uh, talk about two virtues, that scholarly virtues, that were exemplified by the two great thinkers and scholars that the Mises Institute uh, promotes, uh, Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard. And I hope that the graduates of the program will bear these virtues in mind in their future academic work. And the two virtues I have in mind are absolute adherence to principle and the highest standards of scholarly accuracy in research. Uh, neither Rothbard nor Mises would have agreed with Matthew Arnold were it, when he spoke of that huge Mississippi of falsehood called history. Uh, in, we can see in the career of Ludwig von Mises, first, he at the time he was, came into academic uh, promise uh, uh, in the height of his career, almost everyone, all the major parties were in favor of some sort of anti-capitalist views, whether uh, outright Marxism or some form of fascism or some sort of interventionist programs in the market, but Mises never went along with these, this, these compromises. He always, he believed in the free market unconditionally, and he would never deviate from that. Even his friend, the great sociologist Max Weber, uh, made fun a little, who thought very highly of Mises, made fun of him a, a, a little bit for his, what Weber considered his rigid adherence to a complete laissez-faire, but Mises never faltered. And in thinking about the dominant collectivism and socialism of his time, he was not content merely to oppose it, but just to say that he didn't like it. He devised an argument that showed that in a developed economy, socialist calculation, economic calculation, was impossible so that a socialist economy couldn't function at all. In his famous article of 1920, uh, uh, e uh, Economic Production, the Socialist Commonwealth, and developed further in his book in 1922, Socialism. And we can see when I spoke not only about adherence to principle, but the highest standards of scholarship. We can see me in how Mises dealt with critics. He tried to answer all of the major critics of his argument, in each case trying to show what was wrong with their criticism. And this continued not only in the 19. 20s and 30s, but even after he came to the United States in the 1940s, he continued to keep up with the literature 
criticizing the socialist calculation argument. And in human action, he has a very important section on the replies to the what's wrong with the views of the mathematical economists who would criticize the socialist calculation argument. They claimed that we, they could show that the certain the equilibrium equations of were the same for socialism and capitalism so that his argument was theoretically refuted and he responds to that. We can also see in his work, in his command of a historical information, he was a tremendously erudite scholar. We can see this, for example, in his book, Omnipotent Government in 1944, where he has a command of German history in the 19th century. And we see he also uh, has throughout his work, he had a very thorough knowledge of philosophy. Uh, he, he, he's able, say, in human action to quote, uh, not only to quote Nietzsche, but to quote poems by Nietzsche, which are not very well known. And he, he has, uh, he kept up with the work of all the major historians of his time. Uh, he, for example, he has a very penetrating criticism of the great uh, German historian Ernst Kantorowicz in his work on the Middle Ages. And we can see also when Mises came to the U.S., he continued his policy of adherence to principle at whatever, whatever the consequences. Uh, although he was one of the most famous economists in the world, and in the 1930s he'd been, uh, he, in 1920s and 1930s, he'd had quite a bit of influence on policies of the Austrian government, at least in some occasions, and a great many of the major economists in the world who were world famous had been students of his and had attended his seminar. When he came to the U.S., because of his adherence to the free market, he was unable to get a regular academic position, and he did get a position at New York University, but his salary was paid by the William Volcker Fund. He wasn't uh, paid by the university. And one might think that uh, the university would be very happy to have one of the greatest scholars and economists of the 20th century on their faculty, but in fact they weren't, and he was marginalized, but he always adhered to what he believed. He would agree with the hero of the main character of Ibsen's play, Brand, that the devil is compromised. And we can see in the career of Murray Rothbard these same two scholarly virtues. Uh, Rothbard was someone I, whom I knew quite well for many years. He had uh, quite amazing scholarly abilities. He knew a tremendous amount about history. He had really had absorbed, uh, he could just go into a library and read, he would read all the books and articles on whatever topic he was interested in. In this, he followed the, the practice of his PhD uh, mentor, the 
great historian Joseph Dorfman, that he, Rothbard, in his work, would, as I say, would try to read ev absolutely everything on a particular subject. If you look, for example, at his history of economic thought, his two-volume work, which is actually my favorite of his books, uh, he doesn't simply describe the main characters, the main economists, the ones you'll get in the textbook, but he goes into all the very minor figures. He believed in presenting the full extent of all the thinkers at a particular time, and he uh, he was, I would say, of the various scholars I've met in my life, he was the one who really was the most learned. He was the one who, who really knew the most about many different fields. And he, of course, made in, uh, in very important theoretical uh, contributions as well, for example, in his showing that uh, there is on a complete free market, the notion of a monopoly price doesn't have a, a meaning. That was a major extension and modification of Mises' system, and he developed the whole uh, worked out the whole microeconomic basis that of uh, Austrian theory that Mises had only hinted at in human action. Uh, he also made very important contributions to uh, ethics in showing how uh, an Aristotelian natural law theory could be modified following John Locke into an individualist theory in which people would have libertarian rights. And he showed that the free market could supply defense and justice that a, a state wasn't required to provide these things. And we can see in his career someone with Rothbard's manifest abilities would have, had he been willing to modify his, his, his beliefs, could have easily gotten a position at one of the major universities. We can see the contrast between uh, Murray Rothbard's pursuit of integrity and the path followed by Alan Greenspan, who at one time, he, who was a member of Ayn Rand's inner circle and wrote essays, he wrote an essay in favor of the gold standard, but once he had the chance to advance in government, he put aside his free market beliefs and maintained that he was still in favor of the gold standard. This didn't prevent him from uh, becoming uh, the head of the Federal Reserve System. So we see that someone who was willing to compromise went much further in his career than Rothbard, but Rothbard never compromised. And we can see even within the world of Austrian economics, Rothbard always insisted on what he thought believed to be the correct theoretical views even at the expense of getting into disagreements and criticizing other people who held 
views of Austrian economics that didn't uh, fully follow the correct doctrines as he had established them. So uh, I hope that the graduates of this program in their work in Austrian economics will remember these virtues of absolute integrity and adherence to principle and also scholarly accuracy.